Okay, I believe we're recording. All right, so welcome to today's presentation on nutrition for the prevention of colorectal cancer. I'm Pamela Riggs. I'm an outpatient registered dietitian nutritionist at the Integrative Wellness Center at Marin Health. I'm here today with my coworker, Janine Vitali schultz also a registered dietitian. And today we're gonna be leading this presentation together. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Janine and she'll take it from here. Thank you, Pam, and welcome everyone. I'm so glad you could attend this important uh, presentation. Uh, so let's just get started. Um, the learning objectives for today, uh, we want to understand colorectal cancer, um, its prevalence and risk factors. Understand the link between nutrition and colon colorectal cancer risk. Learn the role of specific nutrients in colorectal cancer prevention. Gain knowledge of the dietary guidelines for reducing colorectal cancer risk and identify uh, certain foods to include and exclude or limit in a cancer preventative diet. We're gonna discuss some practical cooking tips for meal preparation um, that will make the putting these uh, guidelines into practice uh, doable <laughs> and understand the significance of regular screenings and checkups in early detection. So let's start with a, a little anatomy review. The colon is the large intestine or sometimes called the large bowel. And the rectum is uh, at the very end of the colon. It is the passageway that connects the colon to the anus. So colorectal cancer is, I wanna go back Pam. Thank you. Colorectal cancer is a disease in which cells in the colon or rectum grow out of control. That is base, the basic definition of cancer, cells growing out of control. And uh, colorectal cancer, again, is sometimes called colon cancer for short. So sometimes abnormal growths called polyps form in the colon or rectum. And over time, some polyps, not all of them, but some of them can turn into cancer. So this diagram shows um, the healthy colon on the left and a very small po uh, colon polyp that has formed. And then the progression um, in size. And then the, the, on the far right, you can see that that colon polyp has actually progressed to a cancer and has invaded the tissue. So it's very, very important that colorectal, um, that polyps are detected early um, and removed when they're still benign and small. So now let's take a, let's review some of the statistics to learn more about the prevalence of colorectal, ca colorectal cancer. So one in 23 men and one in 26 women will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer. That was somewhat of a surprise to me that the prevalence was so high. It is colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer deaths among men and women combined. You might ask what the number one cause is. Um, lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer related deaths for men and women combined. And of all cancers, colorectal cancer will take the most lives of people under age 50 by 2030. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later that, that colorectal cancer seems to be increasing, um, decreasing in age. Next. So importantly, more than 27,000 people under age 50 will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer by 2030. While the rates of colorectal cancer in older adults have actually been decreasing over the last several decades, rates of colorectal cancer in young adults is increasing. One in 10 colorectal cancers are diagnosed in patients under the age of 50 now. This is a troubling, troubling trend. Uh, we don't really know why it, had, why it has been rising steadily since the mid nineties in this younger population. But we do know that patients under age 50 are more likely than older patients to be diagnosed with a later stage uh, colorectal cancer, stage three or four and those stages are less treatable. It's thought that the incidence is expected to increase by 140% by the year 2030 in this younger population. Now, you certainly might ask, why is this happening? Um, researchers aren't quite sure. Uh, 
one, one hypothesis is there's a lack of awareness in young patients and their doctors about the signs and symptoms of colorectal cancer. So it's very important that the, the public and, and our medical practitioners um, become aware of having these conversations with younger patients. So let's go into what causes colorectal cancer. Researchers have found several factors that can increase a person's risk of colorectal cancer, but it's not clear yet exactly how all these factors might cause the cancer. When we get into genetics, it gets quite, quite complicated, but let me try to summarize this. We have some genes that help control when our cells grow, divide, and die. Cancer can be caused by DNA mutations or changes that occur in these genes. This leads to the cells growing out of control. And as you can see in the, in the uh, slide here, there are basically two types of gene mutations. There are inherited mutations, which are actually quite rare. And there are what we call acquired gene mutations, which account for most cases. These acquired mutations happen during a person's lifetime and they're not passed on to their children. Certain risk factors play a role in causing these acquired mutation, but it's not known what causes most of them. So we're gonna go into these risk factors next. A risk factor is anything that raises your chance of getting a disease such as cancer. As you can see here, we have divided it into those risks that you cannot change, such as age or personal family or family history of colorectal polyps or colorectal cancer. And then those things that you can change. Um, in, in many of the lifestyle related factors that have been linked to colorectal cancer, more than half of all colorectal cancers are linked to risk factors that can be changed. So that's very important to realize that we really do have the power to make a difference here. So as you can see, we're gonna go through these factors later in more detail, but the things that we have control over, being overweight or obese, having a sedentary lifestyle, smoking, excessive alcohol intake, type two diabetes. It's been shown that having low blood levels of vitamin D puts one at higher risk. And then of course, a high risk diet, which is what we're really gonna focus on today. So in brief, let's discuss the component, the characteristics of a high risk diet, but we will go into these in greater detail later in the presentation. So a high risk diet is one that is low in plant foods. So low in fruits, vegetables, and subsequently low in fiber. It's high in red meats and red meat is defined as beef, pork, and lamb or liver. And it's high in processed meats. So those are our smoked, cured, salted, nitrate preserved meats. Cooking at very high temperatures can also uh, create chemicals that might raise the risk of colorectal cancer. So again, we'll talk more about um, these risks and how we can prepare food in a healthier manner later in, in our presentation. But now let's focus on some positive diet changes we can make to reduce col can colorectal cancer risk. Uh, you can see here that by following a healthy eating pattern that includes plenty of fruits and vegetables and whole grains, so basically a plant-based diet, and limiting or avoiding those foods we just mentioned, the red and processed meats, sugary foods and sugary beverages, we really can um, significantly reduce our risk of cancers. So now Pam is gonna go into more detail about what really comprises an anti-cancer diet. Thank you, Janine, for giving us a good background on what colorectal cancer is, what the risk factors are, uh, what you can control, what you can't, and that's where we're focused on what we can do, which is about diet and lifestyle change. And so, um, as Janine mentioned, you know, a kind of plant forward diet um, that is rich in fruits and vegetables and whole grains you know, is really kind of at the forefront of a good anti-cancer diet. And I'm going to go into more detail. And so if we look at kind of general dietary recommendations, you know, we do want to eat a predominantly plant-based diet. We want to get those servings of fruits and vegetables in and eat whole grains and beans and legumes, things that have complex carbohydrates and fibers, you know, be mindful of the type of dietary fat that we're consuming and choosing lean, healthy protein sources while trying to minimize 
saturated fats and refined carbs and red meats and charred foods and, um, and alcohol. So again, these are kind of general recommendations and the next um, several uh, minutes of this presentation are gonna go into the details as to why, what, what is these types of foods bringing us from a, a nutrient standpoint and how are they protecting us um, against colorectal cancer? So let's start with dietary fiber. Um, you know, if you look at um, population studies, you know, looking at um, uh, po uh, populations that consume a uh, more um, higher fiber, whole grain type of diet, you know, there's a lower risk of uh, colorectal cancer um, in these kinds of populations. You know, the more processed and uh, Americanized diet, as you would say, uh, the risk seems to be higher. And so fiber is a big component of um, fruits and vegetables and grains. And it seems to be a very strong connection between a high fiber diet and lower risk of colorectal cancer. Why is that? Well, we know that um, dietary fiber, especially insoluble fiber that's in uh, like all uh, whole wheat bread, all bran, um, those types of fibers help uh, prevent constipation. They decrease transit time, meaning that they move our waste through our digestive system um, and out of our bodies uh, to remove toxins and other potential carcinogens that we may have taken in from you know, our food and our environment and all of those things. Uh, we know that fiber promotes uh, a healthy bacteria in your gut. So we have trillions of bacteria in our intestines most of them reside in the large intestines in the colon, and it's really a healthy balance of good versus not so good bacteria that keep our gut uh, integrity intact. And um, even these types of bacteria can ferment these dietary fibers and produce byproducts like short chain fatty acids that support the healthy growth of colon cells. So fiber is really important in terms of maintaining our healthy microflora of the, of the gut. Um, the other thing that in, in turn, um, this bacteria um, microbiome balance can also reduce uh, systemic inflammation. Uh, inflammation is something that's connected to a number of chronic diseases, including cancer. And if you think about inflammation, you know, we, it's part of our immune system. You know, you have acute inflammatory response, which is important. If you cut yourself, it gets kind of red and irritated as a defense mechanism to prevent anything getting systemically into our system uh, that could cause a problem. Um, what we're talking about with cancer and heart disease and other chronic diseases is kind of a low grade systemic inflammatory process. Um, it's your body kind of going, you know, this isn't right. Something's not right here. I'm trying to kind of fight something off. Um, and so we know that inflammation has been linked to, to cancer. So we want, um, uh, again, a plant-based diet, which is anti-inflammatory and many components of that we're gonna be talking about that make up a plant-based diet uh, do have these anti-inflammatory components, including uh, dietary fiber. So where do we get fiber from? You know, we wanna get it from whole grains, uh, you know, a whole grain is something that has an intact uh, uh, layers of the bran, which is the outer layer, as well as the very inner layer of the germ. Um, the fibers in the bran, the germ contains antioxidants, vitamins and minerals and things that are good for us. Um, and when we get a refined and processed uh, carbohydrate, for example, when you take whole wheat bread and or whole grain wheat and you make white uh, flour out of it, they're removing the bran and the germ and just leaving kind of that middle layer, which is pretty much mostly carbohydrates along with a little bit of um, protein. But the bottom line is we wanna go for that whole grain, the intact uh, uh, grain, uh, nothing removed. So uh, brown rice, quinoa, whole wheat bread, oatmeal, your beans, legumes, um, chickpeas, uh, certain fruits and vegetables are higher in dietary, dairy, excuse me, dietary fiber, uh, your nuts and seeds, like uh, chia seeds and flax are a good source of fiber. And, you know, some people choose to take a fiber supplement like a psyllium husk fiber. Again, that all counts in terms of your sources of dietary fiber. So how much do we really need? 
Well, if you look at population studies, once again, nutrition surveys, most Americans only get about half of the amount of fiber that they need um, each day. So depending on who you ask, whether it's American Cancer Society or the uh, Dietetic Association, uh, Heart Association, anyway, it kind of ranges anywhere between 25 to 35 grams of daily fiber a day for adults. Um, if you're not used to eating a lot of dietary fiber, we do recommend that you kind of increase your fiber intake gradually, drink plenty of water. You know, if uh, you haven't been having a lot of fiber in your diet, fiber can cause, you know, gassiness and digestive discomfort if you kind of overdo it too soon, too fast. Um, and the bacteria of your gut really like those fibers and can uh, produce gases and, and cause bloating and things like that if you do too, too much too fast. So uh, just gradually increase it and make sure you get a diverse uh, fiber rich foods in your diet. Uh, lots of different fruits and vegetables and whole grains and those beans. Make sure you're getting a good mix of both uh, insoluble and soluble fibers for your health benefits. The next component of a plant-based diet, I really wanna talk about are antioxidants. And what antioxidants are, are they're compounds that protect our body from harmful molecules called free radicals. Free radicals have been linked to damaging DNA, uh, DNA damage and mutations is connected to the development of colorectal cancer. Uh, we are exposed to free radicals from our environment, from just the normal metabolism that our bodies go through every day produces some of these free radicals as part of that, those processes. So we want antioxidant nutrients that can actually um, uh, prevent those free radicals or scavenge up those free radicals from doing damage to the cells of our body. So antioxidants neutralize free radicals, they reduce inflammation, and I talked about the connection of inflammation and cancer risk. And also uh, many of these antioxidant nutrients also support immune function. And we know how important our immune function is in, um, in dealing with precancerous cells. Oops, sorry about that. That jumped ahead so much. Wow, <laughs> that's crazy. Okay, here we are. So dietary sources of antioxidants. Uh, antioxidants are found, uh, nutrients are like vitamin C and E. Um, they're uh, found in vitamin C is found in citrus fruits, vitamin E or nuts and seeds, uh, beta carotene, which is a kind of a free form of vitamin A. That's that deep orange color in your carrots and sweet potatoes. Um, certain minerals like selenium and zinc and copper have uh, roles as antioxidant nutrients. So we can get selenium in our Brazil nuts and oysters for zinc, uh, nuts and seeds for copper. And then other phytochemicals. So these are other plant compounds. They're not fruits or, I mean, excuse me, they're not vitamins or not minerals, but they're other plant compounds that many of them give um, the fruits and vegetables their colors. So those orange, uh, uh, red in your tomato, the dark leafy greens, uh, in your spinach, the purples and blues in your berries, those are all uh, phytochemicals that provide us some antioxidant as well as anti-inflammatory activity in our body. So we wanna eat a variety of those as well. So just remember to eat a colorful variety of fruits and vegetables. You go into the produce section, all those wonderful colors, the dark leafy greens, the deep oranges, the purples, the blues, um, the reds, we certainly want to get a variety of colors in to get those phytonutrients and the vitamins and minerals that are going to provide um, potent antioxidants in our food choices. Uh, you can also get those from nuts and seeds um, and whole grains in your diet. And outside of, you know, foods, we're looking at beverages like green tea, very high in antioxidant components, um, as well as the uses of spices like turmeric that have a potent anti-inflammatory effect, but also an antioxidant effect. So there's lots of ways if you're eating a plant-based diet to get in a lot of antioxidant nutrients. I wanna say one more thing about our vegetable category, uh, cruciferous vegetables. So that's um, this group of um, particular vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower that have some potent anti-cancer uh, activity 
Um, one of the components that's found in broccoli is sulforaphane, and it has a strong anti-cancer activity to help support uh, detoxification processes in our body, as well as been found to kind of hinder the growth of cancer cells. So lots of good reasons to get our cruciferous vegetables in as well when you're shopping in the produce aisle. Um, and I would say, you know, so we're talking about broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. And I think over the last couple of years, many of these foods have had their heyday in terms of being a superfood, very popular and trendy. Just thinking about cauliflower over the last couple of years, the cauliflower rice, the cauliflower pizza crust, the roasted cauliflower, um, cauliflower steaks that people are grilling. So there's just different ways to get in on these wonderful cruciferous vegetables. Um, and again, you can add them to stir fries and salads and side dishes. You can steam them lightly to preserve their nutrients. For some of you who may not really like raw cauliflower or broccoli um, or like it a little bit more um, cooked, roasting it with a little olive oil, throwing in some of that turmeric uh, that I mentioned before, that roasting kind of gives it a little bit of caramelization to these types of uh, vegetables and really makes them quite delicious. I could literally eat a whole head of cauliflower that's been roasted um, with a little bit of olive oil uh, in the oven, so delicious. So experiment with different recipes, find your favorites and include as many cruciferous vegetables into your day as, as you see fit. All right, so the next nutrient I wanna talk about is folate. Um, it's a B vitamin, um, an essential B vitamin that we need to get through our diet. Um, I think what's interesting about folate is that uh, this is sh this kind of discussion here explains kind of the complexities of nutrition science because um, at so some point some things are may not be beneficial for us at high levels or during certain times in our life. And so with folate, for example, it's a B vitamin, there's been plenty of research. It's probably one of the strongest nutrients that have been studied as it relates to colorectal cancer. And we've, um, we have a, a mix of data. So most studies suggest that people who have a lot of folate in their diet um, early in life and throughout life have a lower risk of colorectal cancer. Um, where things get a little tricky is depending on whether you already have polyps or you've had colon cancer before, there's the possibility that high folate um, intake well, may actually fuel cancer cell growth. So on one side, it can prevent cancer cell growth. On the other side, it may actually promote cancer cell growth. So it makes recommendations a little tricky, um, but I would say that the bulk of the data suggests that the reason that folic acid is a chemopreventive nutrient is that it has a strong role in assisting in DNA synthesis or the damage of, uh, or repairing the damage of DNA. And we talked about DNA damage uh, being connected to mutations, right? And then the development of cancer cells. So it may be helpful in, in repairing damaged DNA, uh, controlling cell division in the colon, so controlling that so it doesn't get out of control, and also lower inflammation. As I said, the data is a little bit mixed that some studies have suggested that if you already have cancer, colon cancer cells developing, precancer cells, that too much folic acid or folate um, is going to be potentially problematic. So where does that lead us with recommendations? I think you can still feel comfortable in getting more folate in your diet through leafy greens, the plant foods that we've just been talking about, legumes, um, citrus fruits, avocado, asparagus, they're all good sources of folate. There is um, some folate um, that's already been fortified in our foods like breads and pasta and rice, breakfast cereals. And the reason is that back in 1998, I think the United States and Canada passed legislation to fortify these foods with some folic acid um, to prevent the risk of neural tube defects, which is a type of birth defect in, um, pregnant, in during pregnancy, right? So 
Um, we do get some in our diet from some of these fortified foods. So many of breakfast cereals, for example, as I said, or breads, uh, rice, pasta, have a little folic acid um, added to them. So again, uh, I think the home, the, the message here is to include these in a plant-based diet. Um, you can make a full white rich smoothie with your greens and citrus fruits. I would just say avoid excessive supplementation. So if you're taking a daily multivitamin that's got you know 400 uh, micrograms, that's totally reasonable, but we certainly don't wanna be uh, taking high doses of uh, folic acid supplements uh, most likely. Okay, on to calcium. Um, Calcium has been another nutrient that's been really studied for its relationship with colorectal cancer risk. And what the data suggests is that uh, people who have adequate calcium intake in their diets tend to have a lower risk of colorectal cancer. And it may support colorectal health by, again, helping to control cell proliferation in the colon. Um, the other thing that calcium does is it binds with bile acids. Now, bile acids are produced in the liver, stored in the gallbladder. When we eat foods that are high in fat, we release that bile to help digest the fat in our diet. So most of those bile acids will get reabsorbed, um, but some of them kind of hang around in the large intestines and they may do some damage to the colon cells. The other thing is the bacteria that I mentioned um, in our uh, large intestines can actually use these bile acids um, and produce secondary bile acids that may be harmful again to our, uh, uh, our colon cells. Um, so adequate calcium seems to help bind some of these bile acids, reducing cancer risk. Uh, great sources of calcium include our dairy products, milk, yogurt, cheese, uh, fermented dairy, uh, includes also kefir. Um, you've got our dark leafy greens. Um, there are some fortified foods. You might see some calcium added to cereals and orange juice. And certainly if you don't drink cow's milk and you're doing an oat milk or an almond milk or soy milk, usually calcium is fortified in those plant-based milks as well so that you're getting um, your calcium there. When we talk about calcium, I think we can kind of go to vitamin D as well, because vitamin D, one of the roles that vitamin D plays is helping our bodies utilize calcium um, and incorporate calcium into our bones and keep our bones strong. And a lot of the research on vitamin D needs or recommendations for dietary intake come from bone health studies. But what's interesting about vitamin D is vitamin D is it kind of acts like a hormone in the body. We have vitamin D receptors in all of our body tissues. And so vitamin D does more than just helps our body utilize calcium. It supports a healthy immune um, system. It helps control cell growth. We're kind of really interested in vitamin D status in cancer patients. Um, and so we really uh, do want to have a sense of what our vitamin D status is. So vitamin D, as I said, helps regulate cell growth, may help enhance our body's defense by boosting immunity against cancer cells. And where do we get vitamin D? Well, we know we get vitamin D uh, from sun exposure. Our skin can make vitamin D. Problem with that is, as many of us are not exposing ourselves without sunscreen for you know periods of time where we can make enough vitamin D, um, if you're overweight, uh, vitamin D gets kind of sequestered in our fat cells. And so it doesn't circulate to kind of do its job, depending on where you live in the country. Um, studies have suggested that if you draw a horizontal line from Los Angeles to Atlanta, if we live above that line, which we do here in the Bay Area, um, we may not even make enough vitamin D from sun exposure, just based on kind of the latitude of our existence here. And they know that, you know, uh, populations that live kind of in the northern part of the uh, hemisphere um, tend to have lower vitamin D uh, status and um, potentially higher risk for colorectal cancer. Um, so in addition to sunlight, you can get some in your diet, salmon, tuna, mackerel, some of the fatty fish. Um, some foods are fortified, you know, milk has a little bit in there. Um, I, I would just say if you, uh, and I'll have a next slide talking about vitamin D testing to find out where your vitamin D status is. 
sometimes if you're deficient, it's really hard to get your vitamin D level up to a, a healthy range with just food alone. So that's where dietary supplements um, come into play and um, can be significant in terms of improving vitamin D status. So what are the recommendations for both calcium and vitamin D? Um, calcium, I think what we're looking at is their recommendation anywhere between 1,000 to 1,300 milligrams, depending on your age um, in terms of meeting your calcium needs. And that would be, you know, we want to do food first and supplementation maybe to fill in the gaps if necessary. Um, so we're not talking about a super high calcium diet, but meeting kind of the recommended dietary um, intakes. In terms of vitamin D, as I said, kind of the best way to know how much vitamin D you need would be to have your vitamin D levels tested. It's not something that's generally um, part of a you know lab uh, lab order from your doctor with the physical. So I mean, you may have to ask for a 25 hydroxy vitamin D test, but it's very easy. You don't have to be fasting, um, and you can kind of see where your levels are. So if you are 20 nanograms per milliliter below, that's a deficiency. 30 to 20 to 30 is insufficient. 30 is what we're kind of shooting for to get into the healthier range. And, you know, reading some of the research I'm on vitamin D and colorectal cancer, still unclear what the optimal vitamin D level is, but we're looking at probably around 40 to 50 nanograms per milliliter as being a good range for an anti-cancer um, benefit. So if you haven't had your vitamin D test done, um, ask for that the next time you talk to your doctor and have to get some lab works done. All right, we're getting through this. Um, just wanna talk a little bit about omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3s are essential fatty acids, meaning we have to get them from the foods that we consume. Um, they're omega-6, omega-3, omega-9, uh, different types of these structures of polyunsaturated fats. And what we know about omega-3 fats, which I'll talk about kind of their sources again in our diet, um, they have anti-inflammatory effects. So a diet that is higher in omega-3s can kind of shift our body towards more of an anti-inflammatory state. Um, there may be also some cell growth regulation and inhibition of tumor growth uh, that benefits from uh, omega-3s in our diet. So where do we get them in our diet? Um, fatty fish, so like wild salmon, mackerel, even sardines, anchovies, um, those are good sources of omega-3s. Uh, we can get plant-based sources, again, slightly different form, um, but our body does use those uh, omega-3s and it's a, a good way to, again, overall increase our omega-3 fatty acid intake by including like flaxseed and chia seed because they are um, packed with omega-3s. You'd wanna kind of grind those flax seeds to release some of those um, oils, uh, but those are really a great way to get the plant sources. Um, walnuts are really the only nut that is a good source of omega-3s. So that's another plant option for those who may not um, care for fish. And certainly you could take a fish oil supplement if you want. Um, there's nothing wrong with that if you really don't like fish and, and don't feel like you're getting enough. Um, so how do we incorporate those? You know, regularly have fatty fish in your diet as much as you can. Um, general recommendations are twice a week to have a serving of fish, anywhere between three to four ounces would be great. You can sprinkle ground flaxseed or chia on your yogurt or cereal, add into smoothies, snack on some almonds, throw some almonds into your oatmeal or a salad. Uh, so just a few ideas on how to add these foods um, to get your omega-3s. All right, so I just went through all of the dietary do's, the things that you want to include. And now I'm gonna hand it back to Janine to talk about the things you might want to cut back on or limit and the reasons why. All right, Janine. Okay, thank you, Pam, for reviewing all those healthy foods. <laughs> I yeah. almost hate to uh, <laughs> I almost hate to go into this section, but as I stated earlier, um, we were going to get into a little more topic, uh, a little more detail about a high risk diet, so we can learn really um, the specifics of what the risk is and how we might work around that. Uh, 
so research has shown consistently that a diet high in red and processed meats puts one at a higher risk of colorectal cancer. And the evidence also suggests it probably is associated with a higher risk for prostate cancer and pancreatic cancers. So there's plenty of reasons um, in that those statements alone to try to redu reduce your intake of red and processed meats. So again, when we're talking about red meat, we really do mean beef, pork, and lamb. And um, I suppose we could also include in there a wild animal like venison, um, bison, elk, et cetera. Though we don't have a lot of data on those wild, um, those wild animal uh, proteins. What, what's the problem with this? Well, there's a lot of hypotheses. We don't really know the mechanism by which red meat increases the risk. Um, basically, we look at population studies and look at observations. And so those observational or epidemiological studies show that high red meat intake does seem to be a risk factor for colorectal cancer. One suggestion is it's the high heme content, the heme iron, which may promote the cancer cell growth. Um, cooking methods also produce carcinogenic compounds. And we're, we'll go a little more into that on the next slide, um, but let's just focus for one moment on processed meat. So within the meat category, especially problematic are what do we call our processed meats. And so that could be bacon, sausage, hot dogs, deli meats. You know, I grew up eating so much bologna as a young child, but we didn't have this data back then. Um, but we've now realized that processed meats, again, which are also include smoked meats, um, salted cured meats and those that are preserved with chemicals such as nitrates seem to be especially problematic and especially unhealthy for the gut. Um, so there really is an emphasis on trying to um, reduce or eliminate those foods from our diet. Next. So uh, the cooking that we discussed earlier, um, carcinogenic compounds such as heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are formed when red meat, pork, fish, or poultry is cooked at a high temperature. Okay, so when you've got those flames um, flaring up and the fat in the meat dripping down and smoke being formed, and then you get that dark, you know, uh, crispy coating on the meat, which a lot of people do like, I understand. That really is not healthy. Those are those um, carcinogenic compounds that are being formed on those meat proteins. So you're really going to want to be very careful with your cooking methods. Um, in general, avoiding grilling, broiling, pan frying, or searing the meat, barbecuing, char broiling. Now, I know that's a lot of people's favorite <laughs> favorite ways to cook, especially in the summer. But again, keep in mind that it's, it's the open flames, the high heat, um, the fat that is dripping on those coals or on the, the, you know, on the flame, causing that smoking, and then that smoke adheres to the meat. So those are the, the things we really want to avoid. The next slide will give us some suggestions about you know, specific recommendations. Um, when we talk about uh, eliminating red meat, that's not really, um, I, I know many people who just say that's not an option for them. They kind of weigh the risk benefit and they feel that um, they really enjoy red meat and they still want to include that in their diet. So for those, the, the recommendation is to limit the amount. So less than or equal to 10 ounces of red meat per week. And if you're thinking of um, maybe a size of a deck of cards, that's approximately three ounces visually. So it might be three small servings of red meat per week, um, but certainly we're getting away from that huge steak laying on the, you know, on the plate with just a very small token amount of vegetables. When you think of this anti-cancer diet, as Pam had suggested, half of that plate should be covered with your plant foods. A quarter would be your lean protein. So occasionally that could be red meat if you chose. And then the other quarter of the plate would be your complex carbs. We really want to minimize the processed meat and um, opt for nitrate-free options. You'll probably um, notice in the grocery store that the food industry has caught on that people um, are, are wanting healthier cuts of meat. And so the words you want to look for are uncured, no preservatives, nitrate-free, 
um, that's really what you're, you're going to want to look for if you're trying to find an alternative. And I know in our family, we've sort of switched to like the chicken apple sausages that are made with free range chicken and no nitrates, no nitrates. Um, brands such as Adele's or Applegate Farms are, are some that you can think of. And even keep in mind something like a turkey luncheon meat. Even though it's not a red meat, if it is preserved with those nitrates, again, we want to get away from that. So do look for, you know, the sliced turkey breast that says uncured, no nitrates. Um, back to the red meat, um, there's a visual up here about the different cuts of meat. The leaner cuts are really what, what you're going to want to choose for those that 10 ounces per week. Um, sirloin, tenderloin, um, the flank or round steak, ground bison is leaner. Um, there's a, a picture here of a, a grass fed ground meat product, ground beef product. So again, uh, we think that the grass fed meat is an, a healthier option. We definitely know that an animal that's eating grass as opposed to eating solely corn has more omega-3 fats in the diet. And as Pam mentioned, omega-3s are more uh, immune friendly. They kind of prevent chronic inflammation. So uh, the hope is that the grass-fed animal products, and that goes for eggs and chicken too, uh, grain-fed, I mean, grass-fed, free-range, et cetera, um, are going to be the healthier, the healthier animal products to consume. And then some cooking methods. Um, it's interesting to note that marinating the meat before grilling it or barbecuing it really does reduce the formation of those hydrocyclic um, amines. Um, so, and it also tastes a little better. <laughs> so go ahead and marinate ahead of time. Um, Pre-cook the meat perhaps in the microwave or the oven to reduce the time needed on the grill. I've tried that with chicken um, so that you can just quickly put it on the grill. And, you know, after many attempts at trying to barbecue uh, skinless chicken breasts, I have resolved that it's better to barbecue it with the skin on and then just take the skin off at the end and not don't eat it. Um, it's a nice little protective coat for the chicken. It keeps it moist. And if it gets charred, which it inevitably seems to do when my husband and I barbecue, we just take the skin off and before we serve it. And you can top it with a little extra barbecue sauce or something to, you know, um, make it a little tastier. You're going to flip that meat frequently. Um, and again, keep the, the temperature low, keep the meat uh, away from that that flame. So consider indirect cooking methods also, such as maybe putting your salmon or your chicken in foil packets or using a grill pan that again is going to reduce the exposure to those flames and reduce the charring. All right. So next topic of, about things to um, minimize. Um, alcohol comes up. So numerous studies have established a connection between alcohol consumption and an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Uh, the possible mechanisms, again, there's the DNA damage, um, those mutations we talked about earlier. So alcohol itself can damage the DNA. It can cause a more pro-inflammatory environment. And again, it's the chronic inflammation that we want to avoid. And then there could be some impaired nutrient absorption along with um, excessive alcohol intake. So how much alcohol can one safely consume? Well, you know, <laughs> the answer to that's gonna vary depending on who you ask. But most of the major health organizations um, consider one drink daily for women or two drinks daily for men to be acceptable. But I have to say that with certain health conditions, that probably would also would even be too much. We do have data that su suggests that women um, who drink daily, who drink alcohol daily, are at a higher risk for breast cancer. So again, if you have a high risk of breast cancer in your family, that's something you're concerned about, you're going to want to reduce your intake of alcohol, probably to not more than two to three, three alcoholic um, beverages per week. Um, the risk appears to rise with the amount of alcohol consumed, but as, as I stated with the breast cancer, even daily alcohol, which was sometimes recommended in a Mediterranean type diet. Um, you know, there was some evidence that maybe a glass of red wine a day could help uh, with heart health. That's being reconsidered. Um, but you have to just keep in mind that um, daily alcohol is not something that's safe for everyone. So I would probably have a conversation with your physician um, about your risk factors, your health concerns, 
and um, come up with, you know, what would be an acceptable amount of alcohol for you? Again, keeping in mind your, your current health and maybe your risk factors. So kind of an interesting uh, new thing that's that's trendy now is mocktail parties. Um, I know we have them at the hospital once in a while. Our employee wellness department does it sort of just as a um, uh, community event for our healthcare providers where we'll have a non-alcoholic beverage. Um, we did that around Halloween just so people can mingle and have fun and have an enjoyable little uh, snack and beverage. And uh, Pam found this book called Mocktail Party, which is 75 plant-based non-alcoholic recipes. So all of our favorite alcoholic drinks like mojitos and piña coladas, et cetera, can be made virgin or non-alcoholic. And I think, especially with the holidays coming up, this could be a really fun thing to include in your party. Um, you could go totally alcohol-free, or if that's not going to fly with your family, you could at least have a really appetizing um, mocktail, non-alcoholic beverage that's kind of um, highlighted so that people really are drawn to it. So maybe you get out a nice pitcher and, you know, you make a um, a beautiful batch of one of these mocktail recipes, put some nice garnishes on there so that it's really enticing. And the kids can also drink it and have sort of a special drink for that, that occasion. Keep in mind, sparkling waters um, with fruit can be really um, tasty and refreshing, especially if you're one that doesn't drink enough water. I know personally, I have a hard time drinking water, but if I put, you know, some cut up uh, lemons or limes or berries, maybe cucumber in the summer, mint leaves, anything that can kind of give it a little flavor. Um, and also just adding some herbal tea to it can be nice. Um, and Pam mentioned the benefits of green tea, um, that that has so many good health um, properties. So think mocktail party, think non-alcoholic beverages. And, um, you know, that, that might be sort of fun to check out that book or go online and get some new recipes. So one more kind of heavy topic <laughs> before we summarize. Uh, sugar always comes up when we're talking about cancer. Um, you may have heard it said that sugar feeds cancer. Um, I find that that's a really unhelpful oversimplification of a really complex topic. Uh, so we want to just take a few minutes here to sort of review that, that topic. So it's most important to realize that all cells, including cancer cells, use glucose as their primary fuel. Okay, so um, yes, a cancer cell does use sugar, but so does all our other healthy cells. So uh, we have to kind of get a, dig a little deeper into the biochemistry. Um, but let's just back up a moment. What is glucose? Well, glucose is, is the, the sugar that comes from foods such as um, carbohydrate-rich foods, which can include vegetables, whole grains. There's small amounts of sugar in our vegetables. We want to con continue to eat all of those foods. Um, dairy is also uh, has naturally occurring sugars, which is called lactose. So those are not the sugars we're recommending we restrict. You certainly continue to eat those as part of a plant-based diet. But then of course, we all know what the other sugars are, right? Um, the candies and sweetened beverages and sodas, desserts, refined carbohydrates like white bread, um, you know, something made exclusively with white flour. So glucose that comes from these refined carbohydrates and added sugars are the, are the, the topics or the, the carbohydrates we're recommending we all reduce our intake of. These simple sugar, sugars and refined carbohydrates are digested very quickly. They cause our blood sugar, sugar levels to spike very quickly. And as we'll see on the next slide, that's where the, the, the problem arises. So when we eat a high carbohydrate food, especially for eating it on this empty stomach, say we drink a big glass of soda or sweet tea or even juice for that matter, there's very little to slow down the digestion. So as our sugar spikes, you know, it's absorbed into our bloodstream, our blood sugar spikes, our pancreas senses that and releases the hormone insulin. Insulin allows sugar to go into our cells where it's utilized or stored. So that's a life-saving, healthy mechanism in our body. But what we've come to realize is that when that insulin is secreted, it also is accompanied by a hormone called insulin-like growth factor. 
Now, again, insulin-like growth factor has a role in the body. It supports growth in our uh, developing years. Um, but as we go older, our insulin-like growth factor should be decreasing. Um, it stimulates cell growth, protein synthesis, and insulin actions over our life cycle. But in excess amounts, excess insulin and excess insulin-like growth factor can also produce uh, chronic inflammation. So you may have heard of the term of hyperinsulinemia, meaning chronically high blood insulin levels. That is not a good situation. So that means that the body is in sort of a chronic inflammatory state. Um, acute inflammation, meaning your body has responded to an acute injury is a normal life-saving response. But once that injury has resolved, we're supposed to down-regulate all those pro-inflammatory hormones and substances. And what we're now realizing is many of our chronic health problems have a basis or um, a component of chronic inflammation um, that's kind of fueling them. So the chronic inflammation and the kind of pro-growth environment that high insulin levels can cause is really the culprit. And that is what we think might uh, cause uh, overstimulation of cell growth. So you can see in this little, um, the, the graph to the right, we really want to avoid this blood sugar roller coaster, which is when we eat a refined carbohydrate, our blood sugar spikes, body puts out insulin, our blood sugar drops, and then we do it over again, right? That is not a healthy blood sugar pattern. The green line showing a nice slow rise in our blood sugar as we eat a complex meal. Um, and then a slow, it's slowly dropping. It's in a much uh, more controllable range. So the body doesn't have to over secrete the insulin to control it. So in summary, what do we do? Well, you keep perspective and balance. Okay. So avoid any of those blogs or, you know, uh, sound bites that just tell you sugar sure, feeds cancer and scares you. You really want to go back to this biochemistry we, re we reviewed simplistically reduce the intake of our simple sugars in our diet, right? So if you have the habit of adding sugar to your coffee or tree, tea, try not to, right? Maybe use a herbal sweetener like monk fruit or stevia as sort of a transition. But most of us can get used to plain tea, plain coffee without the added uh, sweetness. Um, try to choose more complex carbohydrates, so more whole grain products as, as opposed to refined. Um, that fiber, as Pam said, also has other wonderful characteristics. It helps with blood sugar control, but it also helps move our stool through our, our gut so that we don't have that, um, buildup of, you know, we don't have a sluggish, uh, GI tract where we have constipation and the bowel being exposed to toxic elements for a longer time. You can use the glycemic index as a rough guide though. You could look up glycemic index and see list of foods that it will tell you those that have a low glycemic index, meaning they will um, digest more slowly and your blood sugar will be better controlled. And then you'd want to avoid those with a high glycemic index, things that are just going to shoot your blood sugar up real quickly. But the most important take home message would be eat balanced meals. Okay, so if you're eating a carbohydrate in the presence of fiber, fat, and protein, those other nutrients slow down digestion, they slow down the absorption of the carbohydrates, and you're going to have a much better glucose uh, blood sugar control and requiring much less insulin. So instead of drinking that, that glass of juice, try eating the whole apple or orange. Okay, the benefit of that fiber is, you know, there's so much, so many benefits. And it also is more satisfying, right? You're going to feel like you ate something and have that satiety. And then better yet, try to eat that apple along with a healthy protein and fat. So dipping it in some almond butter would be a really simple, simple, healthy snack. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to turn it back over to Pam. Uh, we just have um, a few more topics to discuss. And Pam, you take it home. <laughs> um, yes. So we're getting to about the hour. We do have a few more things to mention. So for those of you who can hang in, that's great. We're, as I say, we're recording this. So if you miss some, um, you can go back and watch uh, what you missed. Uh, so in the... The other thing that we're concerned about is obesity. Uh, obesity is actually a risk for several different types of cancers. You can see the graphic on the right 
um, from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, the different types of cancers that have been connected to obesity and being overweight. So, you know, based on what we understand today, people who are obese um, have about a 30% higher risk of cancer. Um, and why is that? Well, oftentimes with obesity, we have these high levels of insulin and insulin-like growth factors that Janine just mentioned. And also with obesity comes oftentimes chronic inflammatory conditions. And so we've, both of us have mentioned the connection between inflammation and cancer risk. So uh, again, it's something that uh, we can try to manage to get to a healthier weight. Um, doesn't mean that, you know, if you've got 50 pounds to lose that you have to focus on 50 pounds, but rather getting some modest weight loss, uh, 10, 20 pounds can certainly decrease our risk of a lot of weight related conditions. So just, uh, every, every pound counts and uh, we just wanna do what we can to uh, prevent weight gain as we get older. And um, if you can uh, have some modest weight loss, um, it's gonna benefit you from uh, a lot of different health uh, reasons. So. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but just want to let those who are listening know that I do offer our Healthy Weight for Wellness program. It's a 12-week program. Um, I work individually with folks um, virtually or a combination of virtual and in-person. Uh, we may be offering a small group virtual program in 2024. It's kind of been on hold with the pandemic, but looking to bring that back um, if we can uh, if people are interested. Um, and so if you are interested uh, in learning more about the Healthy Weight for Wellness program, please feel free to call me or send me an email. Um, my email is pamela.riggs at mymarinhealth.org. Um, and if you go on to the uh, Integrative Wellness uh, Marin Health website, you can also learn more about the program. So that's um, available to you. Um, I do wanna kind of wrap things up by talking about the importance of screening. Uh, more than 20 million Americans are eligible for colorectal cancer screening who have not been screened. Um, and you know, early detection is so incredibly important. Um, and the earlier detected, the more curable it is. Um, so I really wanna encourage people to seek out screening if you have not um, done so. The CDC estimates that 60%, 68% of deaths from colorectal cancer could be avoided if all of us who are eligible um, actually got screened. So again, so important um, to talk to your doctor about um, getting screened. Um, there's a couple different options these days. I know people are kind of hesitant to go through the process of a colonoscopy. Uh, because of preparation for that is no fun. Um, but certainly uh, the recommendation today is um, people who over the age of 45 should get screened annually, or not annually, screened for uh, colorectal cancer. And again, talking to your doctor about um, the options. So if you are hesitant about a colonoscopy, there's also fecal hemoglobin tests where you just do a fecal um, sample and uh, that gets uh, reviewed um, for pathology. Um, certainly, I, I often see commercials now for Cologuard, which is a DNA marker test. So you can um, get that delivered, do the test, send it back. And at least it is uh, one other non-invasive way to do uh, the colon screening. Um, certainly, if a, a positive test were to come back, uh, the doctor would probably recommend a true colonoscopy. The one benefit of colonoscopy, right, is doctors can go in there, they can see what's there. If there's early stages or polyps that are there, those can be removed um, at that time. So it really, you know, makes sense in terms of um, getting a, a colonoscopy, uh, especially if you're, you know, at real high risk. Um, I think it's also important to just kind of know some of the risk factors and signs and symptoms so that you can catch it early if you are experiencing things. So some of the seven signs of col colorectal cancer, again, some of you, you may you know have these things that it not be colorectal cancer at all, but um, you know if you've noticed changes in your bowel habits and the characteristics of your stools have changed, maybe there's more 
frequent diarrhea or constipation, um, certainly if there's any signs of rectal bleeding or blood in the stool, that is a, a red flag to talk to your doctor about. Um, ongoing discomfort in the belly area, you know, cramps, gas, pain. Again, these could be from other things going on, irritable bowel, just different things that could be um, happening, but certainly a, uh, a symptom to, to be aware of. Um, maybe a feeling that your bowel is not emptying all the way uh, during a bowel movement. If you're um, very weak and tired, you know, if you're having blood loss, uh, if you're anemic, uh, that would be a potential sign, um, or if you've lost a lot of weight without even trying. So just be aware of some of the early signs. And if you notice anything, uh, talk to your doctor about screening for uh, cancer. So kind of as we wrap things up today, you know, what can you do? So here's the call to action, right? Get screened if you haven't, or talk to your doctor about it, uh, and change the things that you can change. Uh, if you can achieve a healthier weight, if you can be more active, if you smoke and can stop uh, or cut back on smoking, uh, I know how, I was never a smoker, but I know how difficult that one lifestyle change is for many people. Um, moderate alcohol intake, um, as Janine has talked about. Um, we talked about maintaining healthy blood sugar levels, right? So avoiding those simple and processed carbohydrates where it's spiking your blood sugar um, and making your pancreas put out more insulin and insulin growth like factor. Get tested for vitamin D. Uh, as I said, pretty simple uh, thing that you can do. And then to eat uh, an anti-cancer diet, which again is something that is plant forward, lots of different fruits and vegetables, high in plant proteins, um, not a lot of red meat, not charred meat, not processed meats, um, a lot of high fiber whole grains, healthy fats, herbs and spices. Uh, and we'll leave you with a nice anti-cancer day, uh, breakfast ideas, a little bit of steel cut oats with some ground black seed, um, or a veggie scramble with eggs and tofu at lunch. Maybe have a nice colorful salad with your cherry tomatoes, your yellow bell pepper, the orange carrots, um, red cabbage, the blueberries. Again, you're getting all the colors and some nice plant protein from pumpkin seeds, garbanzo beans, or baked tofu with a nice vinaigrette dressing. Um, dinner, you're going to have that omega-3 rich salmon with some brown rice and a spinach salad with your sliced oranges. There we got our folic acid in there. Um, and again, uh, maybe not a sweet dessert, but a baked apple with a little bit of cinnamon and ginger. And if you do need a snack during the day, maybe a little Greek yogurt with some berries and a nice glass of green tea. All right. That was a whole lot. Um, <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> but as we kind of wrap things up here, I just wanted to thank those of you who are able to attend today. And a moment here, I'm going to turn the recording off. Um, and if anybody does have any questions, um, we could take just maybe five minutes to answer some questions. But I do want to remind folks that we do provide outpatient nutrition services. Um, Many insurance companies will cover nutrition counseling with a registered dietitian, depending on the reason that you're being referred. Um, and if you have any questions about um, our programs, uh, other educational events that we have, please feel free to reach out to any of us. I've also included, I've got my email, Janine's email, as well as Julie Larner, who is on the, um, an attendant today. She's also one of our registered dietitians available to provide nutrition counseling. Um, and you're welcome to reach out to any of us to get more information about our programs. So I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can stop this recording.